Academica Media. From Academica Media Studios in Miami, Florida, it's Big Ideas in Education, a weekly recap of inspiration and innovation in your schools. Hello, education lovers, and welcome to Big Ideas in Education. Happy to have you here with us this week, and happy to be back on, what would you call this, uh, Dr. Fire, our regularly scheduled programming, uh, you know, yeah, just doing the education little... news again, yeah. <laughs> Right. We took a little bit of a, a break to highlight some of our Teacher of the Year candidates. And I know we yeah. had a, kind of a, a fortuitous timing and we have some congratulations to offer. Safe to say, I think we nailed it in terms of the timing of our series highlighting the four finalists for National Teacher of the Year. Because the very week, the very week that we did our show on Ohio teacher, no, yeah, Ohio teacher Kurt Russell, that was the week that the... Uh, the National Teacher of the Year folks announced that he was, in fact, the winner for this year. That's right. So. Congratulations, Kurt Russell, the history teacher from Oberlin High School in Ohio. Wow. Nice poll. That was awesome. But it, it's it's uh, so cool for him and cool for us because we had to have been. I have not looked this up, but we had to have been the very first <laughs> podcast to have Kurt Russell related programming when he won that award. I can imagine like people seeing the announcement on Twitter and just being like, I need to hear somebody in education talking about him. And what's the only game in town? Big ideas in education. We were ready. <laughs> we absolutely nailed it. Uh, and but again, in all seriousness, congratulations to him. What an amazing educator. And it was our pleasure to be able to highlight his achievement and the achievements of all of the other finalists for that wonderful award. Right. Absolutely. All right. But now we're back to our regularly scheduled news programming, bringing you your weekly installment of inspiration and innovation in education. And uh, I did not mean to rhyme that. Of course, I meant to rhyme that. That's what I do here. Uh, Sarah, what do you have for us this week? Well, as we're nearing the, the close of the school year, many teachers and parents may be having some difficult conversations about whether students are, in fact, ready to move on to the next grade level. This is particularly poignant with the disruptions in regular schooling that we've experienced globally the past few years. Understandably, this can cause some anxiety for families facing this possibility. That definitely was the case for Katie Arnold Ratliff, who shared her fears while sharing the research she collected in a blog post, which of course we'll link in the description. Researchers have gone back and forth on how earlier or later attendance in kindergarten in particular impacts students in the future. For example, a 2009 study found that kids who are younger than their peers do better in school because they rise to the maturity level and academic ability of the kids around them. But another body of research, famously explored in Malcolm Gladwell's best-selling book, Outliers, indicates that holding a child back a year lets them develop emotional control, social ease, and a stronger base of knowledge, helping them excel academically. Another 2009 study showed that older kids in a class are held back a grade and diagnosed with ADHD far less often than their younger peers. For years, parents have been holding their kids back a year before kindergarten, a practice known as redshirting to buy them these very advantages. However, <laughs> a 2021 study out of Finland indicated that younger students in a class are more likely to be diagnosed with learning disorders, potentially because their developmentally appropriate abilities are being judged against those of much older kids. But it's no picnic for the older kids either. If the younger <laughs> kids in the class are disruptive, as younger kids are more likely to be, studies show those interruptions can have a detrimental effect on the entire class. So it may feel very frustrating as a parent to think, I'm not sure what the right thing is to do for my child, right? Um, we, we hear so many different things about whether holding a child back earlier is better for them and how it's going to um, – provide different advantages in the future. But frustratingly, you know, as Emily Oster, the guru of parenting related data, wrote in a newsletter on red shirting, and she's the author of some pretty famous books on parenting, such as uh, Expecting Better and um, Crib Sheets, as many things in this era of life, the data is a piece of the puzzle, but only a piece. 
So these conversations that parents are having with the teachers have to take into account so many different pieces of the puzzle, right? We have to take into account academic data that the teacher is bringing to the table. We have to take into account social emotional pieces, how mature the child is at that point, how they're doing compared to their peers, and if they're ready to move on to another grade level. And I think especially because we have had such strange happenings in the past couple of years, we're seeing a lot of immaturity in younger children compared to where we might have seen a five-year-old 10 years ago or a seven-year-old 10 years ago. And I'm hearing from a lot of parents that they're scared of retention. And when we say retention, you know, we're talking about holding kids back after they've already completed the grade. So maybe a kindergartner repeating kindergartner, a first grader repeating first grade. And, you know, I think a lot of that comes from a stigma of like our own schooling. When we were kids, being told that somebody was failing a grade was – it was a pretty stigmatizing situation, right? And so I think that that carries on into our thoughts about our own children or the students in front of us. But really we have to think of that kid, what's going on with them. And we can't make broad strokes or, you know, wide ranging decisions based on just research. We have to look at that kid and really triangulate the data. Yes. Uh, Great summary of the data. And I I will admit, I'll confess that this is something of particular import to me personally, because I actually have a baby due in July. So they're going to be right on that. Where's that? Come on. Where's that? (laughs) <laughs> Congratulations, Thank baby you. Corella. <laughs> um, and, you know, so it's going to be one of those summer babies where if I start my kid on time, they'll be one of the right. younger kids in the class. And I mean, I'm glad that you brought up this story because like my wife and I are having this exact conversation right now. And we're getting lots of feedback and much how your studies indicated this. I'm hearing every different direction on it. And what it really comes down to is what's best for your particular kid. And I think you have to look at that through the perspective of whether they're academically prepared at that age for kindergarten, but also whether they are emotionally prepared and, you know, whether they're, you know, and and that's a whole other very different category. I will say this. I do love that the term red shirting has made its way into the lexicon for this. Cause like, (laughs) I I I only knew about it from college football. Yeah. Right. That's how I knew it as well. Like, you know, it, 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 the idea of like, starting my kid a year later just sounds more exciting because now I get to feel like Nick Saban while I do it. So that makes it (laughs) all the better. But to me, one of the ways that I think we could be removing the stigma of retaining your kid, whether it's starting kindergarten a year late or just having them repeat one of the grades they've already done in the elementary years is at least at the high school level, we're already starting to see a blurring of grade levels. Two different 10th graders could be doing very different curriculum like one you could have a 10th grader at one school who's taking uh algebra two and another one who could be taking dual enrollment calculus or something like that and so at the higher grade levels like we're not all like at, at no 10th grader is created equal and so right. we so we should also because we understand that students are in different places and that's very much going to be the case at the elementary level too and so if a student is being uh, retained or held back, it doesn't mean that they are not academically prepared or poised for great success. It just means that as those studies note, the particular needs of your kid at the time might warrant, uh, you know, repeating a grade, slowing things down at those early years to make sure they get the development that they get. And I, I'm very much going to want to take that approach with, with my child of just seeing where they are. And, you know, I very much, I was a September baby. So, I was fortunate to be the older kid in my class and you know, and you know, I was you, the opposite. You get to be the first the kid to have your driver's class. license, which is cool. You were the younger one. I was um, the youngest one in my class wow. because I was August. So August and September yeah. and backed up, at least in Florida. Um, in this article, uh, she shares that her child was I want to say like one or two days. I think her her child's birthday was October 3rd and the cutoff where she lived was October 1st. Yeah. So it's such and it's such an arbitrary yeah. line that's drawn in the sand. It's I it's to my understanding it's not based on a lot of research, but it's funny that you know 
similar experiences that I was the youngest in my class and you were the oldest in your class. And look, we're both here and we're both very we're both successful here. people. Because, <laughs> well, 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 I mean, you're absolutely right when you refer to this idea of arbitrary lines. All of this is arbitrary lines. The date cutoff, arbitrary line. The notion of grade levels is exceedingly arbitrary. And if we were sort of developing a education system from scratch, we wouldn't just be grouping grades by years. Like, really, so, you know, we're, what is happening with our kids is just a product of a system where we have we're grouping them by uh, an annual period that are just lines we drew in the sand for you know a reason that today might be inappropriate and so you should not uh, feel any sort of uh, disappointment in yourself or your child if they don't fit perfectly right. into one of those lines and as you mentioned those lines become even less noticeable as the child gets older right no so kidding. as we get to middle yeah. school and high school you know, we have middle schoolers who are taking high school level courses. We have high schoolers taking college level courses. I mean, it's really, I know in some, you know, just anecdotally in some conversations that I have with teachers and parents having this exact conversation, I, I actually pose some more questions to the parent who's a little reluctant and to the teacher and ask, can, can you help me understand what your concerns are. And they're valid, you know, they're all valid concerns, but they range from, I don't want my child to feel, um, as though they're the, you know, the big kid in this, in the class, they don't want to feel like their child is the biggest one in the room. And they see that, you know, and it just has to do with development because we have, I've, I mean, I literally took my phone out and showed pictures from a class. And I said, I want you to see this child who's the largest child in the room. How old do you think that child was? Because it, they, that child was not held back. They just were bigger, it's just a big you know? Kid, and yeah. so it was just a big kid. Sometimes kids are just bigger than their peers, right? So there's kids on all ends of the spectrum. So I think being honest and a little vulnerable about where are these fears coming from? And are they valid in the sense that like, is it true that that's what's going to happen to your child? Is it not? And, you know, and I would never want to just simplify it to like, let's make a pro con list. Although I'm not going to lie. I love a good pro con list. <laughs> Boy, um, that's always a good time. But really being honest about what the fear is and where it's coming from so that we can collect data to see what are we going to do about it? And in what ways is this going to impact the child? Right on. I got a cool story for you here, Sarah. A little, a, a, I can't a, wait. Yeah, this is all about productive struggle. So sometimes when you're trying to learn something new, if you're anything like me, you might be inclined to want an easier learning experience. Just let me watch the video lecture. Just let me read and highlight something and I'll learn what I need to learn through these, shall we say, more passive approaches. And studies show that our students feel that way too. Students generally want the easiest, most passive path to learning. But as Edutopia has noted in a recent video, learners often learn best when they avoid passive learning tactics and instead embrace what researchers call productive struggle or being pushed beyond one's comfort zone to more challenging learning activities. Here's a clip from the video. Students often believe that low effort studying strategies are the most effective, favoring passive learning approaches like memorization, rereading, highlighting text, and listening to lectures. But those tactics can leave students with the false impression that they've mastered the material, when they almost certainly haven't. Meanwhile, struggle in the classroom is viewed as a sign that things are going badly. Teachers and students may opt for smooth sailing instead. But the truth is that easy and learning don't usually go hand in hand. It's when students are pushed beyond their comfort zone to solve problems that are hard, but still within their ability, that they engage in productive struggle and dramatically improve their learning outcomes. In a 2019 study, for example, researchers discovered that students preferred lectures to challenging activities like hands-on experiments and group problem solving. Unfortunately, the lecture students scored 10 points lower than their counterparts on the follow-up test. And in a landmark 2008 study, seventh grade students who regularly practiced solving complex, open-ended problems became sophisticated thinkers, outscoring their peers from a more traditional lecture-based classroom by 57% when answering challenging test questions. Temporary confusion and frustration aren't necessarily things to be avoided, the researchers concluded. Instead, they're the precursors to deeper, more durable learning. What makes productive struggle so effective? When students struggle to apply learning in new and challenging ways, 
They are more likely to probe for novel or unexpected connections, consider multiple ways to solve problems, and wrestle with the underlying differences between correct and incorrect solutions, all hallmarks of long-term retention. They also develop resilience, complex reasoning skills, and learn how to set and achieve goals while developing a healthy attitude toward making mistakes. So think about how to push your students toward productive struggle and try to be patient if they express frustration. Explain that temporary confusion isn't a sign of weakness or incompetence. It's how brains are supposed to feel when they are on fire with activity. Now, Sarah, I would have always thought intuitively that you know, product, you know, productive struggle leading to, you know, to higher learning outcomes makes sense, right? If you are putting more work into the learning process, you'll get more out of it. But even I was staggered by the data that they were showing in that video about how much the difference <clears throat> is and how much uh, more significant the outcomes become when we actively engage students and ourselves in that productive struggle process. So I became familiar with the term productive struggle uh, closer to 10 years ago when um, Common Core became really popular, right? Right around 2009 when when Common Core was becoming um, a thing. (laughs) And it was a main tenet of the math component of the Common Core standards was understanding and encouraging productive struggle. So this is something that I was really learning about because it's not something that I grew up. um, I mean, I think that term was just not something that I grew up with. And it's not something I was taught in education, becoming an educator. And so that idea of productive struggle is something that I think as you you build your experience as an educator, you kind of recognize it. It's so incredible to watch those gears turning in a kid's head and and you you may have them doing a, a, a project even if it's something you know hands-on and they're doing something and you see them do it the wrong way for lack of a better term I'm using air quotes when I say the wrong way but you see them do it and fail and you see them do it and fail and you see them struggle with it and and finally you know there's definitely moments and hello even as adults we do this where if something is not working for them you know you give up. It's absolutely you give up. But then there's these moments where it's like something clicks and they need that encouragement. I've actually heard productive struggle talked about really well if you use a metaphor of video games. So video games do this really well in the sense that they give you enough opportunities to fail and then to succeed, to get you fail, you fail, you fail, you get a taste of success. And so you get back up and you want to do it again. Right. And so some of these games are really addictive because it's like they give you enough taste of success to keep wanting to go and do it again. Nobody's going to want to play that video game if you can't get past the first obstacle. Right. So, you know, you got a little taste of it, a little taste of it, a little taste of it, you succeed. And then you drop and it's like, oh, what happened? I want to do that again. You want to get that endorphin rush of I did this and I was successful. Um, And so when we take that into the learning world, we have to think about how can we build activities for students that are going to give them that similar sense of accomplishment and and how are they going to be on fire for this? I love that phrase of like when brains are on fire. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that too. And I think the term activities is uh, useful here because one of the reasons why I am such a strong proponent of project-based learning is I think it's a productive struggle hack. It is a way to inherently provide productive struggle for your students, but you're so engrossed in the activity and you're and you're so excited about accomplishing the task that you don't think about the struggle. Like it, it doesn't seem like as much of a hassle to be struggling because you're just enjoying moving forward. And video games to me is the best metaphor that I could possibly think of. Cause you're right that they do this really, really well. And I've been c- continuously intrigued by the research that people are uh, educators are doing now about adapting video game psychology into the classroom mm-hmm. because of how good video games are at keeping people motivated and keeping people to wanting to advance into the game. And I think a key right. component of video games and the and cla- you know, video game psychology, the classroom and productive struggle, it it makes us want to evaluate the grading process because as educators, we cannot say we want our students to engage in productive struggle. It's okay for them to fail and then have an ABCDF grading system where if you mess up the first couple assignments before the big assessment, you're going to get a bad grade that is set in stone. 
Nothing about that encourages productive struggle. So instead, what we might want to see are grading systems that adopt a more video game psychology based method of evaluation where your character might die a thousand times, as mine often does when I play any video game. <laughs> and as long as you meet the goal at the end of the game, that's really what matters. And so our classroom should be working the same way. If we're serious about wanting our students to engage in productive struggle, we should be focused on a more mastery based system of evaluation where if you get to if you beat the boss at the end, eventually, that's what should matter in terms of your final evaluation and not if you engaged in some struggle along the way where you didn't do as well on the assignments as you would have hoped. It's really well said. And I mean, we've often, you know, we've we've touched on standards mastery uh, based grading in the in the past on the show. Um, and it also, you know, brings a little bit of badging in there, too. Right. So can mm -hmm. you um, can you prove that you've mastered this? OK, you're going to get a badge for that. Can you get a badge for that? And again, it, it kind of just reminds me of other video games that do similar things. But it also I think as an educator, I think too of students, like what is the the line between productive struggle and just frustration level? So in, in literacy, we talk a lot about where can a student work independently? Where is their instructional level? And then where's their frustration level? And we don't want students to spend too much time in the frustration level because it does, it does create this kind of, I, I just can't do this attitude. Yeah. And so building on that understanding, we could bring in some tools for our students. So like, what happens if I feel like this? Or what if I get to a point where I don't know what to do? How can I bring in some tools so that they can do that independently, right? So maybe even just like an anchor chart, like, have I tried this? Have I tried that? Have I asked somebody, hey, what happened when you did this? What happened? You know, not for them to do it for them, but just ask, how did it what happened when you did this? Or you can use, you know, kind of like some teachers use like, okay, there's a flag on your desk or a sticker that you put on your table that says, I need help right now. I'm stuck and I need some help. And the teacher can come over or another classmate might come over um, and the teacher can kind of assess, okay, so show me what you did so far. Sometimes just even in the explaining of the process, the student is now recognizing, oh, you know what? I think I could have done it this way and helping them to kind of, you do that meta conversation, metacognition of what happened when I got stuck? Why did I get stuck? Did I try this avenue? Did I try that avenue? And teaching students how to think that way and teaching students how to process that is something that I don't know that we've always spent any time doing. And that's really important to the idea of getting them to that independent level of can I move forward with this? How will I move forward with this? Absolutely. It's it's really and, and that and that's a cultural shift that needs to happen in education Absolutely. where we create an environment where that sort of struggle can be appreciated and then we create the right infrastructure to uh, allow students to be able to negotiate that struggle and get where they need to be. And I think it's about, you know, creating the equilibrium, the optimum amount of struggle, enough struggle where the student is achieving great outcomes, but not so much that they get frustrated. I think of a a classic episode of The Simpsons where uh, Lisa Simpson, you know, the brainy uh, child of the Simpson clan is just becoming frustrated with how easy her elementary school is. And like she just feels completely unchallenged and she's so motivated to seek challenge that she enrolls in this like really regimented, rigorous military school, the complete opposite of her school. And it winds up being a nightmare for her because she was so ex you know, excited about being challenged. But she gets into this environment where she's like, you know, marching every day and like doing all this athletic stuff that she just was not built to do. And, you know, one day she's like talking to her uh, friends about it and she's like and they're like, hey, Lisa, you said you wanted a challenge. Why are you complaining about military school? And she said, yeah, I want a challenge, a challenge I can do. <laughs> um, and, you know, th I think, you know, that's the to me, that is like the hilarious, uh, you know, emblem of finding that sweet spot where they you know you are moving that student forward you are achieving the amazing outcomes outlined in that video with just enough productive struggle without inspiring frustration folks you've got today you know education <laughs> advice from video games and the simpsons we so got deep into the pop culture we're, I love it. we're doing it we're doing That's it right
And we encourage you to be part of what was a pretty fun conversation this week. Please tweet at us at Academica Media with the hashtag Big Ideas in Education. Let us know what productive struggle looks like in your classroom. We'd love to hear all about it. Sarah, this has been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks, Ryan, and thanks for listening. The views expressed on the preceding program have been those of the hosts and guests and do not necessarily reflect the views of Academica, its clients, staff, affiliates, or advertisers. 